I hope you can see and hear me. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Um, hi, Hannah. Hi. Uh, let's see, that's the only person that's showing me. But I know I saw something else a second ago. Hi, Key Squared. Um, I think I also saw you resubscribed. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also just saw Lord Portico pop in. <coughs> there. It just took the chat a second to catch up. I, I went live and then I was getting really unstable internet, which is honestly normal for when I'm streaming from home. It is not normal from here. And so I actually had to take the stream down and power cycle the, um, the little router that's over here. <clears throat> and uh, that seems to have corrected it. So we're good. Um, if there's too much white noise, do let me know. It is um, frigid in the library outside this room, and yet this room still manages to be boiling hot. So I still have a fan blowing on me, <clears throat> and it's actually blowing a little bit harder than in previous weeks because it's somehow warmer. I mean, it is one of the warmest days that we've had this year. Uh, so <clears throat> if there's too much fan noise, let me know. I'll see if I can adjust the position of it or possibly turn it down and still be functional. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, that's the, the heat in this room is also playing fun times with my sinuses, but I will attempt to get that under control as we move along. Anyway, welcome everybody. <laughs> Uh, I hope that your week is going well. Welcome to uh, a Wednesday afternoon here in the Eastern Time Zone. Um, and I'm coming at you live from the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. And we're going to look at some stuff from one of our archival collections. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, I am going to just uh, read the university's land and labor acknowledgement. Um, this is something that I typically try to do. Oh, no captions. Thank you, Portico. I just saw that, and there are no captions because I forgot to turn them on. Um, they should be active now, and hopefully uh, you can now see the captions. <coughs> Uh, so let me go ahead and, and read out the Land and Labor Acknowledgement. Um, it, to me, is very important that we keep this in mind, that we pay attention to it, and that, um, you know, for me, as a, a member of the faculty here at the university, that I work to actually live up to the ideals stated in this by our institution. Um, so Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim, then I may serve. In the spirit of community, diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable and inclusive community. <coughs> so as always, thank you for uh, supporting me in uh, constantly reiterating the university's land and labor acknowledgement. Um, I need to copy this command over. There. Um, also, we just got raided by 16-bit Eric. Welcome in, Eric. Welcome in, Whimsies. <coughs> I hope that the end of your uh, stream went well. I hope that you um, were thoroughly enjoying uh, V Rising, I believe was the game that you were playing. Um, it is great to have you here. Um, 
So the plan today uh, for this stream, if you're new here or just uh, need a refresher, um, this is once a week where I stream from the University Libraries at Virginia Tech and I share materials from our archives. Um, you're rating in on my personal channel and uh, you can check out the rest of my streaming schedule below, but um, this one day a week is um, me streaming from work. So <laughs> um, the plan today is we're gonna look at the BP Blazing Game papers. Uh, BP Blazing Game, Benjamin, uh, I believe it's Benjamin Paul Blazing Game, uh, was an engineer with AC Delco and worked on a number of the Apollo missions. And so we have a number of items uh, from him that are part of our collections here. And we're gonna be looking at some Apollo era space flight engineering uh, materials. If you all think that that's interesting, um, <clears throat> that is the plan for today's stream. Uh, but yeah, welcome in Eric and everybody. And um, it is good to have you here. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, just mention, if at any time anybody wants to know um, some basic information about the collection that we're looking at today, there is the exclamation point finding aid command in both channels. Um, and that will pull up a link to the finding aid where there is some basic description, a list of the materials in the collection. If you take a glance at that finding aid and you see something listed that you're curious about and want to see, I will make sure that we look at it today on stream. Um, <clears throat> there's just one thing in the collection that we can look at but I don't have the ability to have us listen to it because as far as I know, it's not been digitized. And I don't have a vinyl record player as part of this setup up here. Possibly in the future, we can listen to some, uh, some audio that's on records. I don't know. Um, everything is possible. I just have to figure out how to make it happen. Uh, so, BP Blazing Game this week, next week, uh, I have selected a collection that I had never heard of before that I just randomly found uh, by searching through our subject headings and saying, that sounds interesting, I wonder what it is. And we have a collection with thousands of wine labels. And I'm like, I have to look at this. I need to know more. So that's what we're doing next week. But this week, it's going to be BP Blazing Game. I'm going to switch over to the document camera and uh, the you all can look at the cover of the first item while I read a little bit of biographical information about him and a little bit of information about what's in the collection. So, <clears throat> there we go. Um, yeah, indeed, Thorkel, wine labels. I, I was very surprised. Uh, like, at first I looked at it and I was like, <clears throat> this doesn't sound like a very interesting collection. And then I started reading this description and I was like, this sounds like a really interesting collection. I need to see this. Um, <clears throat> but that's next week. This week we have BP Blazing Game Papers, circa 1962 to 1978. Um, and what we have in here, uh, Dr. Benjamin Paul Blazing Game was born on August 1st, 1919 in State College, Pennsylvania. He majored in mechanical engineering at Pennsylvania State College and was a cadet in the school's ROTC program. He graduated in 1940 and was called to active duty in the United States Air Force in 1941. While still in the Air Force, Blazing Game received the, his Doctor of Science degree in 1950 from the Massachusetts, Insti Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After his military career, Blazing Game became the Director of Engineering of AC Spark Plug the, engine, the electronics division of uh, <clears throat> the electronics division Delco of General Motors. So AC spark plug within Delco at General Motors, which is where you get AC Delco. Um, under his leadership, Delco would become the leading contractor for NASA's Apollo guidance and navigation systems. Uh, there is a link in here. I have not checked it to see if it works. Um, and it indeed does not. Uh, so I will have to note that for correction. Um, <clears throat> apparently the Air Force used to have a, a more extensive bio biographical sketch of him and uh, that is no longer there. Um, 
The BP Blazing Game Papers contains several books, reports, and papers about navigation, inertia, and spaceflight. Although the majority of the materials are undated, they are likely from the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, so we have books, record albums, uh, three books related to Skylab, five books related to Apollo 12, 14, 16, and 17, and the Apollo Soyuz missions, and one guide to orbital flight. And then we have two copies of the CBS production Man on the Moon, narrated by Walter Cronkite, which we can glance at, but I don't have a record player to play them. Um, you can probably find that footage online, or, or audio online. <clears throat> And then we also have papers and reports, including four official reports by this Charles Stark Draper of the Draper Laboratory regarding inertial guidance and navigation, and a report on the optical tracking of the Apollo 12 spacecraft. So there's no way we will look at absolutely everything in this collection today, uh, but we'll have fun looking at what we've got. and. Um, <clears throat> that is the goal. My monitor didn't refresh, so I'm used to glancing over to the right just to get a sense of like where things are. And it's not working today. Uh, it's okay, I have other spots where I can see. Just if I'm glancing over there and, and looking disappointed, it's because that piece of tech isn't working because I had to reset the router and I didn't refresh it afterwards, but it's fine. Uh, anyway, so the first item that we have here, um, this is a Skylab report from Delco Electronics. This is Skylab 3. Uh, it mentioned that there was Skylab 1 through 4, so I'm going to pull out the uh, some of the other things here and just see. <coughs> Yeah. So we'll look at these in a second. First, Man on the Moon, uh, which, as I said, th these are vinyl records. I don't presently have a vinyl record player in this room connected to the system, uh, so I'm not able to play it for you at the moment. But we can look at the records. We have two copies here. Um, <clears throat> that is the, the cover, uh, and then on the back there, this is what the record actually looks like. That's side two, that's side one. It's a little scratched up, but doesn't look too bad. I think I would want to take um, a record brush to it to just clean off the dust and stuff that's on it. Uh, which is honestly not surprising for something this old. Um, <clears throat> what it says on the back, Man on the Moon, narrated by Walter Cron Cronkite, produced by Joel Heller. Uh, now is the time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future here on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon if we, make this, if we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, May 25th, 1961. <clears throat> oh, and we are getting a second raid. Uh, welcome in Mix Harry Ann and uh, everybody from your channel. Um, how are you today? What were you up to? Um, and uh, can I get a, a shout out from one of my mods if possible? Um, you are arriving on Wednesday and Wednesday is when I stream from the uh, University Libraries at Virginia Tech and I share materials from our special collections and university archives. Um, so this is uh, actually going out to two channels. This goes out to my personal channel where you all arrived, 
as well as to twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the library's Twitch channel. Um, and today we are looking at the BP Blazing Game papers. Uh, Benjamin Paul Blazing Game was an engineer who worked for AC Delco, uh, Division of General Motors, and uh, worked on a number of the Apollo missions uh, for NASA as a contractor. Um, and so that is what we're looking at today. <laughs> Um, ooh, Breath of Fire 4. I'm not familiar with that game. Um, I hope that you were having a fun time with it. Uh, but yeah, welcome in everybody. It is great to have you here. If you want to know more about my personal streaming schedule, um, uh, you should be able to find it in the schedule below. Um, uh, I do gaming three days a week and then one day a week on Wednesdays. I stream to both of these channels with archival content. So uh, we were just taking a glance at um, some vinyl records here uh, that I don't have a record player in the room to play. Um, so we're going to move on from them because we kind of got all we could out of them. Um, Breath of Fire 4, helping fairies, rescuing a cat man, Mansell in distress. It's a JRPG. Awesome. Uh, so, the next item that we're going to look at, um, we have a number, we have three volumes about Skylab. Um, <clears throat> so this one is specifically Skylab 1 and 2. And then we also have uh, one on Skylab 3 and one on Skylab 4. And these are the Skylab program description. Uh, these were published by Delco Electronics, um, which is a division of, or was a, a division of General Motors, uh, and was one of the primary contractors for the Apollo era missions. Um, oh, thank you, Mixarian. Um, I, I do enjoy playing the Mass Effect. Um, I, I enjoy some lovely space-related <laughs> adventure gaming. Uh, and those are actually really good games. I had not played them before. Um, so what we have here, let's see, Guidance and Navigation Summary, CM Software, ASPO 45 CRT Displays, Launch and Burn Schedules, Burn Perturbations, Digital Autopilot, Science, Interfaces, and Hardware. We have some general, it looks like possibly either ratings or formulae. I'm not certain. Like, this is clearly a reference of some sort, but I'm... Satellite Orbit SL1, 234 by 234 NMI. I'm not sure what measurement that is. Satellite Orbit Duration, 1 hour, 33 minutes and 12 seconds. Satellite Orbit Rate, 3.86 degrees. Min. NMI. Measurement. We get to learn on this stream. Um, nautical miles. NMI is nautical miles. Uh, Key squared, you got there while I was while I was looking it up. <laughs> um, let's see. Escape velocity surface eleven thousand twenty-seven miles per second, or thirty-six thousand one hundred and seventy-eight feet per second, or twenty-one thousand four hundred and twenty-one nautical miles per hour. That is, what? Okay, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Are nautical miles significantly, oh, this is meters per second. I was like, why would the difference between nautical miles and miles be so different? Uh, it's because I'm reading it wrong. It's 11,027 meters per second. 36,178 feet per second, or 21,421 nautical miles per hour. <laughs> Freedom unit confusion! Indeed, indeed, yes. Uh, one degree on surface is 60 nautical miles. So this is, this is a handy reference for defining measurements that had not 
really previously been needed before the space programs. Um, <clears throat> like, escape velocity to get from the surface of the Earth into uh, inner space or low orbit. Um, probably could have been calculated and had been done for rockets. Um, I would imagine some of the earliest calculations for figuring out escape velocity probably uh, with regard to rocketry in, uh, in specific. I don't know, uh, possibly people had done calculations prior to this, but until rocketry, I don't know that there was anything technically capable of needing that calculation, so I don't know why it would have been done. But I'm thinking like the um, the German VR, uh, V1 and V2 rockets might have been the first time that such calculations would have come up. But I don't know for sure. It's a table of constants, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so defining one degree on surface matters when you start talking about going to the surface of another uh, of another body in space so knowing what one degree one degree of declension on the surface of the earth is may have been useful for certain purposes and so it may have already been defined, but it becomes eminently important when you're talking about going to the surface of another body that is not the same diameter as the Earth. So this was all in preparation for going to, like th this was the era where they were figuring out how to, how to put a man on the moon. Um, and so you have a constant of, 60 nautical miles is one degree. And it may work out mathematically, it, it may just end up being weird. You may have some weird remainder left over on another body that you don't have on Earth. I don't know. I would have to figure uh, that out based on diameter of Earth and see what's, how many degrees, but it should be 360 degrees for a sphere. I don't know, it's interesting. You might calculate escape velocity for astronomical objects too, if you're studying asteroids and such. Yeah, but I, I don't know how often anybody would have done that math, but it, it suddenly becomes very relevant when you're talking about launching satellites or uh, rockets into space or specifically rockets with people attached or uh, as, the Soviets did launching rockets with dogs and monkeys on board. Um, and actually, I believe, now I'm, I'm trying to dig back into my knowledge of the space program in the US, and I do believe that we did monkeys. I don't remember if we did any dogs or not, but there were various animals that went up before humans ever did. Um, uh, just the ones that spring to mind for me were the Soviets because they were the first ones to put animals into space. Um, <clears throat> orbital characteristics. So it's uh, just interesting to me, they've got this, this reference in the beginning of the book and it caught my eye because I was curious about it. Um, and of course, as always, if you see something, if I'm flipping through pages and you see something that you find of interest, uh, feel free to pop it in the chat and I will um, work my way back to it if I've already moved on since there's always a delay between what I say and uh, when I would see any chat notes. Um, so we have a diagram of the main D and C panel. Uh, D and C. I don't know. I don't know what DNC is a, an abbreviation for. Um, CMSM configuration. 
Command Module, and Service Module, CMSM. Uh, so this is the basic capsule, uh, the, the command and service modules for, uh, this would be Skylab. So we have a basic uh, diagram there, orbital assembly. So once in orbit, it actually deploys additional uh, items. The, the Skylab <clears throat> uh, goes from being this capsule, and once it's in orbit, it extends some solar panels, it uh, opens up, you've got the Apollo telescope mount here and some wings uh, that I believe are also solar panels. Um, oh, sorry, the, it doesn't open up entirely. This is me refreshing my memory on things that I haven't looked at in a couple of years. Uh, so just brain. Um, sorry, here's the command and service module attaching to the Skylab satellite, which is what I was, I was like, I guess it opens up. It doesn't, it, it attached. This is why, you know, refreshing my memory, but also learning, because uh, it's been a while since I looked at this. And I, this is, you're watching me interpret what I'm seeing in real time. This is the actual docking alignment uh, diagram. So this is, there's, a receptacle that the tip of the command and service module is attempting to connect with properly. And uh, in some of our Apollo materials, we know that that did not always go smoothly. And we have some documentation of after incident reports and other things like that with um, uh, the docking. We call it Archival Adventures because I'm on an adventure with you. Indeed, indeed. Most of the time, the things that I'm sharing, I haven't seen before. Uh, and so I'm seeing them. Part of what makes this show um, unique and different and why it's a live program instead of me preparing a pre-recorded video and releasing it on YouTube is that we get to see the items in real time together. Um, and so you're, I'm a professional archivist, and, and if I process a collection, I will know more about that collection than anybody else in my department. So if it happens to be a collection I've processed, I'll know what's there. If it's not a collection I've processed, I've probably never looked inside. And so we get to discover it together and uh, sort of mimic the experience that you might have if you went to an archives and um, asked to see a collection and they brought out the boxes for you and left you with them to go through and um, you would probably have a, an intent in mind, something in particular you're looking for, you'd look at the finding aid and say I'm interested in these and you'd focus on those. Um, and sometimes I do that with these, but a lot of times I just go folder by folder and we look and see if we find something interesting. Um, List of routines, list of verbs. Oh, this is for programming. The program Skylark. I'm trying to be gentle because this um, binding is a bit old and if I bend the pages too much, uh, they're gonna start coming out. So I'm trying to find... So this entire blue section is software. Uh, some definitions for software. So like uh, the page that I was looking at here, list of verbs used in program Skylark. So if they're trying to figure out how to generate um, a command in the Skylark program, this would be a useful thing to consult. Um, so these would be the useful or the regular verbs that they could use in the construction of a command sentence for Skylark, if I'm reading this correctly. Uh, display octal component one in R1, uh, octal component two, three, octal components one, two, so you can have multiples. Display decimal, DP decimal spare, Essentially, this is um, D 
defining the vocabulary for the language, Skylark. <laughs> because uh, computer programming languages, which this would have been a, a custom-built computer programming language, um, and unlike the more modular languages, uh, computer programming languages that we have today, everything was hard-coded during the Apollo era. All of the, the computer syntax was hard-coded and, and defined, so they've got these reference charts of lists of nouns and verbs that the program knows how to interpret. Uh, whereas today, uh, programs are set up to where you define certain variables and you only have certain action words that you can uh, perform different actions on defined variables. Here, instead of having uh, an open variable where you can define a noun, for the program and then act on that noun that you programmed in, they have a finite list of nouns that the program knows and can interpret. <clears throat> I don't know that we'll look at all of the Skylab books because they're probably all going to be pretty similar to this, but if I can find a particularly interesting part of the book, we can look at the differences between Skylab 1, 2, 3, and 4. Basic reference coordinates and ref SMMAT. The basic reference coordinate system, BRC, is an orthogonal inertial coordinate system whose origin is located at the Earth's center of mass, figure one, uh, which figure one is down below. Interestingly, um, vocabulary, oh dear. Yep, that's what I was trying to avoid. So we're gonna be really gentle with the book. And I'm just gonna hold it now, and we're gonna look at it at an angle, because I don't wanna go any further. The spine just cracked a little. Um, it's an old book and that happens. Especially, this is a, a paper cover glued on um, and the glue is very dry, which means it's not very flexible. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, orthogonal. Vocabulary, orthogonal. Uh, most English speakers are familiar with the term diagonal. Orthogonal is the opposite of diagonal. So like if you're looking at a compass, diagonals would be um, northwest to southeast or southwest to northeast. Those are diagonals. Orthogonal coordinates would be north, south, and west, east. Um, and that was a term that I wasn't familiar with until Becca, Becca Scott started using it all of the time on, uh, on Game the Game. Um, Becca Scott was uh, a host on the channel Geek and Sundry for a while um, and used to show off board games and, and so uh, oftentimes she would talk about moving orthogonally uh, when reviewing board game rules. Um, Basic reference coordinate system is an orthogonal in inertial coordinate system where origin is located at the Earth's center of mass. The orientation of this coordinate system is defined by the line of intersection of the mean Earth equatorial plane and the mean ecliptic at the beginning of the Basalian year, which starts January 0.92335731950 Eastern Time. What? We're going to need to look up what the Basellian year is. The x-axis is defined by the intersection of the Earth's equatorial plane and the ecliptic in the direction of the ascending node. The z-axis is along the mean Earth-North Pole, and y-axis completes the right-handed triad. Hi, 
I am Puddle Clum. I hope that your doctor appointment went well, and I'm glad that you're here to hang out. Um, <laughs> we are looking at uh, papers from BP Blazingame, who was an engineer for AC Delco, uh, which was part of General Motors, and worked on Apollo era space flight. Um, so I'm very curious, what is this Vesalian year? It's not something I had been introduced to before. The Baselian year is a tropical year that starts when the fictitious mean sun reaches an ecliptic longitude of 280 degrees. This is currently on or close to January 1st. It is named after the 19th century German astronomer and mathematician Friedrich Bessel. The following equation can be used to compute the current Vesalian epoch in years. B equals 1900.0 plus Julian date. Um, and then a mathematical symbol I'm not familiar with, minus Tell if there's a decimal in there or not. The text is so tiny. There is. Minus um, two million four hundred and fifteen thousand twenty point three hundred and twelve or three hundred and thirteen. Wait, uh, thirty one. 352 thousandths divided by, geez, my brain is, I'm not, I don't even remember how to go into like, decim, like, five digit thousandths, five digits after, I don't even remember the proper terminology to go five digits beyond the decimal point. I am, I am not a math person. It was, Definitely not my focus, but <laughs> interesting. But then, it, so great. Uh, it starts on January point nine two three three five seven three of nineteen fifty, according to this book. The the like they they are wanting the Basellian year that begins January point nine two. 33573. Why it was necessary to go seven digits beyond the decimal to that specificity of, of um, timing, I don't know. And they say the x axis is defined by the intersection of the Earth's equatorial plane and the ecliptic in the direction of the ascending node. So that is the, the ring that we see um, drawn around. It is uh, at 23.5 degrees off of the equator. And then the, the, the z-axis um, is along the mean Earth-North Pole. So they don't specify magnetic North Pole, so I assume they mean geographic North Pole. Um, and so that defines the z-axis. And then the y-axis completes the right-handed triad, which is a very strange sentence for me, and I'm not certain exactly what it means, but based on the diagram, the y-axis appears to be at right angles with the z and x axes um, and in line with the equator. Because the x, y, and z axes are all perpendicular. Yes, it's just the terminology is not 
like right-handed triad, I read that and I was like, I have no idea what that means. But looking at the diagram, I'm understanding that the right-handed triad, the y-axis is being defined, it's just meaning that it is at right angles to both the x and z axes. Uh, it's just the phrasing was unfamiliar to me. And, and like I said, I did not specialize in uh, mathematics, um, and especially not in geospatial mathematics, uh, and geometry was my least favorite part of mathematics. So, but I think I, I, I grasp what they're saying. I don't understand why like, it just seems like an arbitrary definition as to where the x-axis is. Like, the z-axis makes sense to me. Uh, it is aligned to the North Pole. The y-axis appears to be aligned to the equator. I don't understand why, then, they define the x-axis at um, 23.5 degrees departure from the equator. Like, I don't understand the reasoning for that, why that makes sense. I feel like the x-axis could have kind of gone anywhere, but maybe it has something to do with um, the shape of a sphere or something else like that that I just don't know because, as I said, geometry was not my strong suit. Referencing the right-hand rule from vector algebra. Yeah, I never got to vector algebra. <laughs> Which is a traditional and slightly ableist way to describe how vectors are oriented in geometric space. Oh, please, yes, define terms for me. Show the top of the page again. Sure. <laughs> I am, I am excited to learn. I did not expect to be learning uh, geospatial coordinate systems today, but I'm here for it. Uh, so do we know what the ecliptic is? So the, the plane of the ecliptic um, is the plane at which, so we haven't discussed it specifically, but the plane of the ecliptic is um, the plane along which the bodies in the system have flattened out. So uh, the, and, and it, I don't know exactly how it was defined, but I believe it has something to do with uh, the average flat plane um, among the majority of the first seven planets in the solar system, because that was as far as they could see at the time those mathematics would have been defined. Uh, but. We generally know that the if you look at the system as a whole and say you put each planet on a disk, they all kind of line up. And so it's like the planets are sitting on a flat plane for the most part. And then you get outliers um, that deviate from that, like Uranus uh, does not conform. I think it's Uranus that doesn't. Uh, but, yeah, so the plane of the ecliptic. So, in this context, is basically the path of the sun as traced out by where it is at noon each day throughout the year. Gotcha! That would be... And, and because, well orientation of this coordinate system is defined by the line of intersection of the mean Earth equatorial plane and the mean ecliptic at the begin. So that is why they specify the date, because where that ecliptic is would change depending on the date because of the Earth's, the Earth tips. Uh, as it rotates around the sun, <clears throat> it, it sort of wobbles. 
uh, which actually is why we get um, winter and summer uh, seasons. Um, and like, so in the Northern Hemisphere, you get winter when the Northern Hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. Uh, and in the Southern Hemisphere, same. You get winter in the South when the Southern Hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. Uh, so Northern Hemisphere, it's winter when the planet is tilted toward the sun and it's summer when the planet is tilted away from the sun. Um, X-axis originates at the center of the Earth and passes through the point where the ecliptic meets the equator. Awesome, thank you. According to Britannico.com, ecliptic in astronomy, the great circle that is apparent is the apparent path of the sun among the constellations in the course of a year. From another viewpoint, the projection on the celestial sphere of the orbit of Earth around the sun. The constellations of the zodiac are arranged along the ecliptic. Interesting. I did not know it had that broader definition. I always thought it was just because in in discussing um, science fiction, which is you know where a lot of my science knowledge originates, uh, and then you know I I learn from that starting point. Um, talking about the plane of the ecliptic with regard to uh, orbital movements of ships or, or like spatial movements of ships, you're generally talking about the plane of the ecliptic being the flat plane that the planets are arrayed on. So it's interesting that it's actually about the path of the sun uh, according to a stationary, well, an observer on a body somewhere in the orbital system y-axis is perpendicular to the x-axis but still the same plane as the equator. Interesting. I just caught my eye because of the diagram and then I wanted to read it and look at it and see and so I think that was really cool. I find this kind of stuff interesting. I did not enjoy my geometry classes when I was in high school and I, I never really got past Algebra 2 uh, mathematically. Uh, I focused more on um, language arts type things, theater, uh, English history, stuff like that. Um, the, maths, the, the math that I enjoyed most in high school actually was chemistry chemical formulas was was what I found interesting mathematically so orbital mechanics definitely not the area of mathematics that I was I was focused on if you imagine the X and Y axes to be on a as being flat on a table the Z axis sticks up perpendicular from the table yeah yeah that that tracks all right I'm going to see what else we've got. Because I'm... The spine on this one already cracked while we were looking at it, and I don't want to hold it open too much longer because I'm going to want to flatten it. Can't, can't fix that uh, without doing extensive alteration. And I'm going to be very careful with the other books here and make sure I don't crack their spines. This one is Skylab 3. We have a lovely launch configuration diagram here. Uh, okay. So you can see Saturn V rocket uh, was being used for Skylab 3. Skylab's Oh, I'm confused. I'm, now I need to look at this. So this is the Skylab 3 program description, but the diagram here, it appears Skylab 2, 3, and 4 are the rocket on the left, and SL1, I don't know what SL, I guess that would be Skylab 1 that used the Saturn 5, but then 2, 3, and 4 moved on... They actually use a Saturn 4B, it looks like. 
And actually, there's a combination here. So we talk about a Saturn V rocket, but according to this diagram, so for the Skylab 1, SL1, which is the one on the right here, which is apparently 350 feet tall, uh, at the bottom here you have a S1C booster, apparently built by Boeing, and then an S2 booster, and then a Saturn V interstage. And all of those would be the pieces that fall off as it's launching into space. Um, over here we have an S1B stage as the initial, uh, built by Chrysler it looks like, um, an S4B stage And then a 4500 LBIU, which I believe is going to be the inner stage on that rocket. I thought rockets were pretty. I did not do rocket science. <laughs> You're probably not surprised that I didn't do rocket science with my discussion of my dislike for geometry earlier. <laughs> Um, DNC panels again. Oh, this book is in such, uh, is in better condition than the one that we were just looking at. Uh, again, we have the program Skylark uh, definitions. CMC idling program to maintain the CMC in a condition of readiness for entry into other programs to update the CMC and OWS state vectors every four time steps. This program is automatically selected by V96E, which may be done during any program. I don't know what the CMC idling program... Oh. I don't know what the CMC is. But apparently they wanted it to be active all the time. Uh, what is the CMC? <laughs> I find many mentions of it, but no definitions of what, what CMC is. Yeah, a number of mentions where I see the abbreviation, but I don't see what the letters stand for in any of the references that I'm finding with a quick search. So I may keep poking and see if somewhere in here it says, but also if any of you know, that'd be lovely. Uh, made slightly more sense after you looked it up. NASA screwed up their own numbering. Skylab 2, 3, and 4 were the missions sent to the Skylab, each with their own Apollo capsule for delivery, but they accidentally got labeled as Skylab 1 with an uppercase Roman numeral, 2 with a lowercase Roman numeral, and 3 with an Arabic numeral, even though Skylab 1 with an Arabic numeral would technically have been the installation of the station itself. That is as clear as mud. Uh, CNC is a digitized sort of drill press or milling machine, but that doesn't seem relevant here. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I just, it's referencing a CMC and I don't see anything that says what it is. Let's see. Pre-launch programs. Gyro compassing program. Oh. 
that doesn't mention CMC anywhere. Pre-launch of service. Optical verification of gyro compassing. Purpose to override, or to, sorry, to provide an optical check for verification of alignment of the stable member during gyro compassing prior to launch. The ast uh, assumptions, the astronaut has zeroed the optics just prior to the program selection. Uh, a minimum of 45 minutes between V78E and PO3 V65E assures proper damping of transients. In order to prematurely terminate this program and return to PO2, the astronaut may key in V34E on any flashing display. Reading this is just making me think of um, uh, some of the incident reports and some of the problems that happened on uh, some of the Apollo missions where um, it became very important that the astronauts were familiar with how the programs worked, how they could clear a specific program in order to run a different program. Um, and, and if you watch some of the like documentaries, I, I want to say is it Apollo 13 that had the, the big issues? I don't know, a number of them had problems. Um, and specifically, one of them had gyro compass issues, and I can't remember which of the missions that was. Um, I, want, I think the gyro compassing was Apollo 14, uh, where they had the gyro compass issues, because uh, they just passed their 50th anniversary for Apollo 14, I want to say, last year? or might have been 2020. I did an exhibit for it, but I can't remember exactly when. Uh, CMC and Apollo might have been the command module computer. That would make sense. I, I was seeing CM and was thinking command module because CM was an abbreviation they used for command module, but I couldn't think of what the third, or the, the second C would be. Yeah. 13 was the one where I, didn't they have a fire? 14 had gyro compass issues that complicated the landing uh, when they were returning. Reading this is reminding you of why having good technical writers is such an important part of your engineering project. Uh, well, I'm glad that I was able to um, uh, give some appreciation to those technical writers. I love that this, this starts with, this is what it's meant to do, and it's immediately followed by, here's what we're assuming at the beginning. And the first assumption is, the astronaut has zeroed the optics just prior to selecting this program to run. Like, there's something you're supposed to do before you run this program. If this program isn't working, it may be because you forgot to do that. Uh, and so that is like the very first thing in there is like, we assume you've already done this. The instructions that follow will not tell you to do so. <laughs> um, and then it gives a sequence of events to tell you what you'll see happen on screen. Uh, input options for where you can change the azimuth and elevation. CMC drives optics uh, line of sight to target one. So command module computer makes a lot of sense there. And yeah, just looking at it, it caught my attention because I was like, I know there was an issue with the, the um, line of sight optical targeting and the gyro compass, and I believe it was Apollo 14, because honestly, that's the one that I am the most familiar with, because I did an exhibit on Apollo 14. Um, and part of that exhibit was looking at the incident reports from the problems that happened on that mission. Just looking to see what else catches my eye, because we have spent 
an hour on just looking at the Skylab things, and there's plenty more to look at, so I may move on from Skylab in just a second here. I picked this collection, and I think it's an interesting collection, but I picked it and pulled it before realizing that it was mostly like published material, like these books. Um, which surprised me, and then I was like, well, I'm still gonna go forward and we're gonna look at these books and they'll be interesting, but uh, it was not what I was expecting. So we have a volume here, Apollo 12, AC Electronics Division of General Motors, Incorp or General Motors Corporation, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Guidance and navigation summary. So this is, guidance and navigation is what um, Delco was primarily responsible for. So it makes total sense that uh, Blazing Game would have had the navigation the guidance and navigation summary here. Command module software, Colossus 2C. Command module DSKY. Computer programs, computer routines, verb codes, noun codes, alarm codes, option codes, checklist codes, flag word bit assignments. Channel bit assignments, computer program description. I just, I see this and I'm like, it just drives home for me exactly how much highly technical information the astronauts had to learn and retain when they were going on these missions because their life depended on them knowing how these computer programs worked. And yeah, they could potentially radio to ground control for assistance in troubleshooting problems, but if it was communications that went out and they had to troubleshoot communications, or if communications was out while something else was out, they were expected to be at least familiar enough with these so that having the technical manuals on board, they could figure out what to do. And it's just the sheer amount of information and highly technical information that they had to be familiar with and be able to remember that some, the information they needed existed, remember where it is, and be able to quickly find it. It's just amazing. Um, <laughs> program 37, return to Earth. Purpose, this program will compute a return to Earth trajectory providing the uh, CSM is outside the lunar sphere of influence at the time of ignition. This program computes and displays a preliminary series of parameters based on a conic trajectory and Astronaut specified time of ignition, astronaut specified maximum change in velocity, astronaut specified re-entry angle. These parameters are time from ignition to re-entry, re-entry inertial velocity, re-entry flight path angle, latitude of splash, longitude of splash, and delta V. When the initial display is satisfactory to the astronaut, the program recomputes the same data using applicable perturbations to the conic trajectory and displays the new values. Upon final acceptance by the astronaut, the program computes and stores the target parameters for return to Earth for use by the SPS program P40 or RCS program P41. Based upon the specified propulsion system, the following are displayed middle gimbal angle at ignition, time of ignition, or time from ignition. Assumptions. <clears throat> this program assumes that contact with the ground is unavailable and is completely self-contained. So this is one of those programs where uh, 
you're going to run it if you have lost the ability to communicate with the ground and need to be able to get back to Earth. It, this is a backup program. This is not the primary means of returning to Earth. This one is for emergency use if communication is lost. Interesting. The ISS need not be on to complete this program. ISS in this instance is not International Space Station. I do not know what the ISS on the Apollo 12 would have been. Um, so if anybody does know that, please share. If value of v VPRED entered in noun 60 is less than the minimum required to return to Earth, the delta V required vector will be computed based on a minimum value. If the value entered is greater than the minimum required to, to return to Earth, then the astronaut desired value will be used to compute the delta V required vector. The computed delta V required vector will be displayed in noun 81. Okay. The DAP data load routine, R03, should be performed prior to completion of this program. The program is selected by the DISCI entry uh, the re-entry range calculation provided by the Alge Kugel routine uh, may be overwritten by a pad-loaded single precision erasable. So the range calculation is a variable. Uh, external delta V flag is reset during this program to designate to the thrusting program that Lambert steering is to be used. I don't know what Lambert steering is. Perturbation theory is the process of doing complex calculations by first doing a simple estimated calculation, then refining it with small perturbations to become more accurate. It's useful for when you're checking out multiple possible solutions quickly and then want to take the time to refine only the one that looks like it will work. Interesting. I have not had to do perturbation theory before. What is Lambert steering? The multi-stage Lambert scheme for steering a satellite launch vehicle. So it is a specific uh, technique for Yeah, it's, it's a method for calculating um, steering for orbital, uh, uh, for items like rockets or other things in orbit or in space. ISS, inertial sensor system. It's the gyro compass. Awesome, thank you, Key Squared. The, the perturbation theory, to me, the thing that comes to mind for me is I used to work in um, uh, employee relocation for a corporate entity. And um, a lot of the benefits that we provided were taxable. Uh, but part of the benefits package was that we would cover the taxes, except that there was no way that we could ever reasonably cover 100% of the tax liability because the total tax liability could never be calculated because every, uh, because um, covering the taxes was taxable. So it was an ever diminishing number and you could approach a final calculation, but you could never actually get there. And that's what came to mind when I was reading the description of perturbation theory was um, this uh, progression, but that's just the definition of infinity, um, which is not perturbation theory.
I love these diagrams. Lunar orbit plane in 1969. Inclination angle, uh, approximately 28 degrees. Intersection of mean equatorial plane and ecliptic at beginning of the Basalian year starting January 0 0.525, 1969. I just, these are really cool. So equatorial plane, the ecliptic plane, and then the lunar orbit plane. And I just, these are really, these are really well done diagrams. And I, we've talked on stream before about um, NASA artists and uh, just NASA employs some really spectacular artists, uh, whether it be um, people creating visionary landscape paintings, uh, imagining what other planets could look like, to people making diagrams like this that are very clear and really well done. I'm just always fascinated by, by any art from NASA. I think that the, uh, and, and this is, you know, likely not from a NASA artist. This is likely from um, somebody working for uh, AC Electronics, General Motors, but on a NASA contract. So um, I still count it as, as NASA art. Launch module controls and displays. want to move on and see what else is in the collection. There's a very large volume in this box. Ooh, it's big. It's like a dictionary. Ooh. I see a link posting request. I will, I don't know uh, if mods can grant permission, if, like if they're around, please, otherwise I can, I can pop out and grab the link. An Apollo glossary, lovely, I will, I will drop that link in myself and, and drop it on the other channel as well. Um, I didn't know this existed. That is a great resource. Thank you for sharing, Key Squared. <laughs> um, so what we have here is a design guide to orbital flight. Um, and as I said, this is like a dictionary. And, and indeed from the McGraw-Hill Book Company, which uh, if you went to public school, possibly private school, but definitely public school in the United States, uh, anytime in the latter half of the 20th century and probably into the 21st century, although my personal knowledge doesn't extend that far, um, you would be familiar with the McGraw-Hill Book Company for publishing most of the textbooks that you used. Um, <laughs> the authors on this are Jer Jorgen Jensen, George E. Townsend Jr., uh, John D. Kraft, uh, Yiri Cork, and uh, uh, there's a foreword by Werner von Braun. Um, let's see. Ooh. This is always good to see. Uh, also, I need to see what we can do about positioning of the camera for a book this large. Um, whoops, sorry. <laughs> you have so many uh, McGraw-Hill ones, unless it was published by Houghton Mifflin or Pearson, yeah. Uh, but definitely McGraw-Hill, major, major textbook publisher in the United States for anybody 
um, who's not from the United States. Because uh, I honestly don't know if they published textbooks in, that were used in other countries or not. Um, but definitely, like, major, major uh, textbook publisher, at least from the 20th century. Don't know, haven't looked. Uh, to see if they're still in operation and actively publishing major textbooks today. Um, there's a letter in the front of the book, which it's a gem. I haven't even read it yet, and it's a gem because everything so far has been published texts. These are what archivists live for, is unpublished texts, papers, personal papers, things like that. Uh, textbooks are a, oh, puddle glum, yeah. Uh, on the Martin Company letterhead, Denver, Colorado, Denver 1, Colorado, uh, stamped, received March 22, 1962, BP Blazing Game, uh, Martin Aeronautics, uh, Martin Company. The Martin Company was an aviation company uh, that moved into the realm of aerospace. I don't know who they were acquired by. Oh, they are definitely still publishing. That is a thank you for that update. Um, Martin Aircraft. We actually, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we looked at some aviation brochures and there definitely were Martin aircraft ones in there. Um, the Glenn L. Martin Company, also known as the Martin Company from 1957 to 1961, was an American aircraft and aerospace manufacturing company founded by aviation pioneer Glenn L. Martin and operated between 1917 and 1961. Produced many important aircraft for the defense of the United States and allies, especially during World War II and the Cold War. During the 50s and 60s, uh, they moved from the aircraft industry into the guided missile space exploration and space utilization industries. In 1961, the Martin Company merged with American Marietta Corporation, a large industrial conglomerate forming Martin Marietta Corporation. In 1995, Martin Marietta merged with aerospace giant Lockheed to form Lockheed Martin. And I don't know why my brain didn't immediately jump to Lockheed Martin. I should have known that off the top of my head. Uh, but so this is the Martin Company where Lockheed Martin gets the second part of its name. Dr. B. Paul Blazingame. Director of Engineering and Research, Electronics Division, General Motors Corporation, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Dear Dr. Blazingame, please accept with my compliments the enclosed copy of Design Guide to Orbital Flight. This book has proven to be a useful reference for our design engineers. I hope that it is of value to you and your staff. Sincerely, C.L. Kober, Director, Advanced Technology Division. Puddleglum, um, Thank you for, for stopping in. It was good to see you today. Um, I hope that your doctor's appointment goes well. <clears throat> Design guide to orbital flight. Uh, definitely not going to spend a ton of time in this book. We'll read the preface, though. Uh, this design guide to orbital flight was prepared by the Aerospace Division of Martin Marietta Corporation as a tool for analysis of basic orbital problems. Much of the information in this book is developed from earlier studies supported by the Navigation and Guidance Laboratory of Wright Air Development Division, United States Air Force. Acknowledgement is also made of the interest shown in the preparation of the book by personnel from the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center, NASA, at Huntsville, Alabama. T.W. Musser, H. Safran, and R.F. Leach of Martin Marietta Corporation contributed to the book as indicated in the chapter headings. Barclay E. Tucker assisted in the preparation of the manuscript for publication. I'm just going to look. Oh, there's the foreword by Werner von Braun. A number of excellent texts on dy dynamical astronomy 
have been written by the most competent astronomers in the field for the engineer who needs theoretical background material. Also available are a few excellent texts on dynamical astronautics written by well-qualified engineers. These texts show in detail how space vehicle performance and design are tied in with Newtonian and even Einsteinian mechanics. But to date, there has been no single volume which lists the following items needed by a flight performance engineer for pre preliminary and conceptual design. Practically all of the formulas of elliptic motion and their variations, geophysical and astronomical constants, analyses of trajectory problems and numerical tables and graphical representations showing quantitative relations between the various astronomical and astronautical parameters. Design Guide to Orbital Flight, written and compiled by staff members of the Aerospace Division of Martin Marietta Corporation in Baltimore, fulfills this need to a remarkable degree. Here, for the first time, a ready reference on satellite flight mechanics is available for vehicle design engineers. In this volume, emphasis has been on material needed for Earth orbital operations, since this is the first step that man will have to master before he can leap to the moon and the planets, and since men and supplies will probably be transported by space trucks and space buses into orbit around the Earth before assembling into space stations and lunar or interplanetary vehicles. The graphs, nomograms, and tables in the book will give numerical values of various parameters to within a few percent. This accuracy generally will be more than adequate for performance studies, preliminary design, and mission planning. However, those engineers who require better accuracy will find in this book a mathematical treatment of the material in three major areas. Basic trajectory consideration, problems of ascent to orbit, maneuvering, rendezvous, etc., and requirements for orbit prediction, guidance systems, etc. Each chapter is followed by an excellent bibliography of the literature. The studies have been handled with a minimum of verbiage without sacrificing detail in the description of the analysis or the results. Numerical and graphical data have been prepared that will enable the engineer to obtain realistic answers to his problems with a minimum expenditure of time. The material in the book has been presented in such a manner that it is possible for one to progress with ease from the basic considerations of each problem to the details of analysis of satellite problems. For this reason, the book will find general use among trajectory and mission analysts, a considerable number of physical scientists, and even professional astronomers. The authors of this volume, in my opinion, have done an excellent job. This book will fill an important gap in the space engineer's library of necessary references. Werner von Braun. Indeed, Lord Portico, and thank you. Uh, indeed, as we review unedited historical documents on archival adventures, we may encounter words and phrases that are derogatory or harmful, either now and or in their historical context. Please feel free to step away from the stream as desired for your own safety and well-being. Um, and in this case, uh, the language um, very common for the time and honestly um, taught to many people as the proper grammatical construction uh, of talking about man instead of mankind and defaulting to he as the universal in uh, sentence structure where um, if you go back historically within the English language uh, defaulting to he was not always the case and actually came about within the past couple of hundred years. Um, uh, before that, it was very common to use they as a gender neutral um, when you did not know the gender of the individual you were talking about or when you were talking conceptually about uh, what could be potentially various people. But also in historical context, um, with professions like this and the timing and dates of this, uh, it was generally assumed that it would be a man uh, doing anything related to space flight or orbital mechanics. Uh, so just a preview of some of the stuff in the book here. Lots of tables, lots of text, lots of graphs. Um, it's a textbook, it's a, it's a reference book for people doing orbital mechanics. 
That is the first box. We have half an hour to look at whatever's in the second box, which, uh, give me one second to put these things back in this first box, and we will see what's in the other box here. Of course, with von Braun, the sexism of his language is usually the least of his problems. Indeed, uh, Werner von Braun historically has other issues. Uh, <laughs> He is a well-known um, historical figure, well-known within uh, the American space program, uh, but also well-known from his activity prior to joining the American space program. Uh, so there are, in this book, four more published volumes. We're not going to focus on these, but I will just show them. We have. Um, as noted in the finding aid, we have the book here for the guidance and navigation summary for Apollo 14, uh, Apollo 16, and Apollo 17. Uh, we also have the ASTP Apollo Soyuz test project. If anybody wants to tell me, I'm familiar with the Apollo missions. Oh. Here we go. I don't even need anybody to tell me. ASTP mission profile. Uh, this diagram tells me exactly what this is all about, which is um, docking an Apollo module to a Soyuz capsule. And so this test program would have been designed around all of the documentation needed to make such a thing possible. In the same way as the others were focused on um, docking the Apollo with the Skylab, or sorry, with the orbital modules. Anyway, we're not focusing on these published items because there are a couple of reports that technically are also published, only they were published internally, um, and as you can see, marked secret and have since been un uh, unclassified. Um, the stamp says unclassified, not declassified. Uh, unclassified. So, w one of them, two of them, Two of them were marked secret and have been unclassified. This is copy number seven of 100 copies. Uh, this document contains redacted pages plus an unclassified brochure made available through the courtesy of Honeywell's Aerospace Division. Uh, this comes from the uh, CS Draper Lab and was given a serial number. It doesn't say how many pages. Um, the, the, the title, yeah, R886, Ultimately Useful Guidance and Geometrical Indication by Charles Stark Draper. Uh, so this was originally classified as secret, not top secret, but it was secret, which is a level of classification uh, below top secret. Um, <laughs> searches for preliminary, preliminarily useful guidance, yeah. Um, it has a letter slotted into the front cover here. Um, <clears throat> on the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory Incorporated letterhead here, 25 June 1975, the enclosed secret CDSL report R886 continues the sequence that was started with the following reports. P030 Summary, importance of research directed toward the development of ultimate performance for inertial system components. And P030, importance of research directed toward the development of ultimate performance for inertial system components. Um, 
In these references, the general situation associated with developments of self-contained systems for indicating geometrical quantities was discussed and specifications for performance of ultimate usefulness were suggested. In this report, these specifications are compared with the results now being achieved by commonly in use and advanced equipments for the purpose of estimating the difficulty of achieving performance of ultimate usefulness in practice. And that is capitalized, performance of ultimate usefulness. What this means, I don't know, but sounds good. A fourth report classified secret dealing with engineering features, production technology, and system design to realize ultimately useful performance from operational equipment is now being prepared and will be sent to you when it is ready. Signed, Charles Stark Draper, senior scientist. Uh, stamped, unclassified when separated from classified enclosures. So the, the letter, this letter, separated from the booklet, uh, is not classified, but with the booklet is classified, because the booklet's classified. Um, so, report R886, Ultimately Useful Guidance and Geometrical Indication, by Charles Stark Draper, June 1975. Uh, the crossed out note here, gave the terms of the secrecy. National security information, unauthorized disclosure subject to criminal sanctions. But it has been stamped unclassified. Charles Stark, Doc Draper, yes, uh, 1901 to 1987, known as the father of inertial navigation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Key Squared, for looking that up. I think we have stuff. Have to now go and look because I don't remember. Um, we definitely have multiple mentions of him, but the problem with the name Draper at our archives is that uh, it's also a local surname, um, and we have local material. Uh, for genealogical research, so Draper Meadow, Draper Meadow. collection that has anything from Charles Stark Draper in it, which honestly would surprise me because we have a lot of NASA related stuff and the Draper labs were big, but I'm not seeing anything else coming up at the moment. Um, Anyway, thank you for, for pulling that uh, little bit of biographical information. Your library has a fest shift for his 60th birthday. Cool. Angular deviation sensor performance corresponding to various location inaccuracy magnitudes after given elapsed time periods. This is a sensor analysis chart. As easy to interpret, in fact, probably easier to interpret than the made up ones seen on Star Trek. <laughs> because the made up ones on Star Trek meant nothing and this one actually has meaning. Uh, ooh, ultimately useful guidance and geometrical, the geometrical indication, background. Accurate, continuous, and immediately available data on the geometrical quantities associated with radiation emitters, radiation sensors, guns, rockets, tanks, ships, submarines, airplanes, VTOLs, 
Helicopters, survey vehicles, orbiters, and space traveling craft have become increasingly important during the recent years and in the future will certainly be essential for effective operation of systems that are basic to the purposes of civilization. Under circumstances that allow working radiation le links, the solutions for the problems of geometry associated with both stationary and moving entities may be based on these alone. However, if interference due to weather, terrain features, water submergence, structural enclosures, etc., prevent effective radiation contacts, geometrical indications by self-contained systems giving reliable, continuous results of high quality during extended time periods must be applied to, com uh, to complement radiation-based information if overall performance of the greatest usefulness is to be realized. In all cases, radiation or mechanical contacts must be used for initial alignments and also for updating indications from self-contained systems. The ideal arrangement for providing geometrical indications is a balanced combination of radiation link subsystems and self-contained subsystems. In the, some of this is going right through my eyes and, and out my mouth without me actually registering what's being said. But um, I was hoping this would tell me what ultimately useful guidance was. Ah, maybe the second or third paragraph will help. The following section of this paper. Sorry, bouncy camera. As always, it, it's literally just a document camera. But um, if any of you ever, if any of the older viewers ever remember encountering um, overhead projectors when you were in school, where it was a big box with a glass top and a thing above and it would light up from underneath and and the thing above would use a mirror to project it onto a screen um, and lots of people printed on transparencies for that purpose this is the modern equivalent of that it is a small armature with a 4k camera uh, in it and it just is a camera that points down at a document and can be used to then put that document up on a screen. Uh, hesitantly raises your hand and recalls the other meaning of Elmo. What is the other meaning of Elmo? Sorry, my brain did not... Did not follow along, Portico. Science and technology. I'm sure you will. You still have some Elmo parts in it. Was it was a brand? Oh, a brand of the overhead projector. Okay. I didn't. I don't think I knew that. <laughs> um. Anyway. The following section of this paper is directed toward an examination in approximate terms derived from fundamental principles of the performance required to satisfactorily control the pointing of sensors and emitters for radiation and to provide ultimately desirable accuracies in terms of geometrical quantities necessary for self-contained navigation and guidance systems operating through regions that include near and far vicinities of the Earth and also the outermost depths of space. So ultimately, desirable accuracies. Leading to ultimately useful guidance. Uh, the, the desire being they want guidance systems that will provide guidance that is ultimately useful. 
some guidance that can be relied upon in order to actually take action is what I'm taking as uh, their intended meaning of ultimately useful. Which is interesting. Ooh, we have color. Color printing. By this point in time, color printing, expensive. Honestly, earlier, a couple, like, half century earlier, color printing less expensive. But by the mid 20th century, color printing is very expensive because a different, uh, of a change in how, like the printing processes. Um, just looking to see if anything jumps out. There's lots of mathematical formulas in here. Ooh, a summary! I love a summary. <laughs> Summaries are very useful for uh, this format. Um, <clears throat> specific force sensor inaccuracies, whether as an additive output bias or as a variation in the output input relationship, scale factor variation, can excite indicated position inaccuracies in the operation of the inertial navigation system of which they are an essential component part. Such excitation occurs whenever the value of the sensor inaccuracy changes. The indicated position inaccuracy starting as a time squared relationship and saturating to a constant time independent steady state value after approximately one hour. The magnitude of the steady state inaccuracy depends directly on the sensor inaccuracy. For example, a sensor inaccuracy of 10 to the minus 8th gravity would never lead to an indicated position inaccuracy in excess of one foot, no matter how long a time period is involved. This means that the transient regime with a highly accurate sensor can be ignored. The constant steady state inaccuracy in indicated position arises from the feedback of the Schuler tuned loop operation in which a gravity component cancels the sensory inaccuracy, thereby halting any further change in the indicated position inaccuracy. Sorry, I got slightly dis distracted because I pronounced it Schuler, but it, 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 it's very possible that it's pronounced Schuyler. Um, the gravity component is due to a tilt of either the sensor itself or of the equivalent reference frame given by numbers in the computer, since one arc second of tilt corresponds to 100 feet of position. A consequence of tilt inaccuracy is an indicated azimuth heading inaccuracy of similar order of magnitude. I love here that this report is highly technical. It is written by a rocket scientist primarily for use by other people who understand rocket science. And yet, certain terms are still defined, such as azimuth being parenthetically defined as heading, because I think there's an awareness by the author that it is, while this report is primarily for rocket scientists to read, they will not be the only ones reading it, and while some of it is just technical information, it needs to be at least partially understandable by people who are not rocket scientists. To achieve indicated position inaccuracy not in excess of one foot at all times requires specific force sensors. All other sources of position inaccuracy are omitted here. With inaccuracies of 10 to the minus eighth gravity or less, such performance falls in the regime of fourth generation technology. I do not know what fourth generation technology is, but it sounds advanced for the time period. Although this paper treats only specific force sensor inaccuracies, it is understood that total indicated position inaccuracy of all inertial navigation system depends as well on similar performance of its angular deviation sensors, computers, servo drives, and the necessary auxiliary equipment. So this is an, it, it was a classified 
Oh, there's an executive summary. I wish I had discovered that minutes ago. <gasps> Pendulous integrating gyro accelerometer. 16 Piga from Honeywell. It's a gyro accelerometer. Honeywell, a progressive leader in precision inertial components. Yes, oh gosh, I know. MIT's Charles Stark Draper Laboratory. I know why I know it and why you should too if you've seen uh, uh, some of my streams. Uh, because um, we did a stream a while back where we looked at materials from Gerhard Mansbach. They didn't show up in my search because they have not been uh, processed yet. It was an accession that we looked at, not a processed collection, uh, just meaning it hadn't been fully described, so there's no finding aid, stuff like that. Um, he worked at the Draper Labs, which is why it was so familiar to me. Pikachu! Oh, Lord Portico. Yes, you should hide from that one. Uh, let's see. There's... 10 minutes left. I want to look at the other unclassified document that we have. Um, we'll just glance here. Internal note. This one is not unclassified. This one does not appear to have been classified. Project Apollo. Official optical tracking of the Apollo 12 spacecraft. We have Report R1185, Inertial Guidance, Basic Geometrical Theory, Sensor Technology, and Subsystem Functions from 1978. Again, not one that was previously classified, so I'm going to focus on the other classified one before we end. Um, we have a report called, uh, uh, report number P727, The Future of Inertial Navigation. And we have a little unpublished document here, Reliability Achievement in Inertial Systems, uh, prepared by BP Blazing Game and presented at several engineering business meetings. We might glance at this one real quick. But first, I want to at least look at this and see um, copy number seven of 175 copies. R923. It says contains 50 pages, but that's been crossed out. So I'm. It appears to still contain 50 pages, but I don't know. Engineering design features of sensors for realizing ultimately useful performance from systems to serve the purposes of geometrical stabilization, control, tracking, and guidance. So it seems like um, all of the things having to do with ultimately useful performance uh, were being classified, which I find interesting. Um, But let's look at this. Prepared in 1973 by BP Blazing Game, uh, over the past decade and a half, the achievement of high reliability and complex systems for military and space applications has been achieved on several very important programs. The systems on which these efforts have been especially noteworthy are illustrated by the Minuteman Missile GNN system, Titan II uh, GNN guidance and navigation systems and Apollo spacecraft and booster guidance and navigation systems. The necessity of very high reliability on the major ballistic missile systems has been a concomitant requirement to the national policy of a credible deterrent. In the Apollo program, the mission was so bold in character involving men in a most unusual environment that it was only logical and rational to make a prodigious effort to assure a high probability of success and survival of the astronauts it would appear that comparable reliability is required for the space shuttle. Presuming this to be true, the cost estimates for all subsystems should include the cost and feasibility of achieving specified reliability. Some general guidelines for navigation system reliability, which are ambitious yet feasible, can be based upon both the Apollo experience and more recent experience with navigation equipment for commercial airline and military transport application. The Apollo guidance and navigation equipment has been found to exceed a mean time between critical flight failures of 2,390 hours. Added assurance of the success of the Apollo mission is provided by the fact that during a significant part of the mission there are two onboard systems, command module plus lunar module. And throughout the mission there is a backup attitude device. Further, primary reliance can always be placed upon the ground tracking network. 
in the whole of the Apollo experience. No failure of such seriousness in the guidance and navigation systems required any of the fallback modes. In the unique experience of Apollo 13, of course, the system in the lunar module was used to conserve power in the command module and served actually as the primary guidance system from the instant of the explosion until shortly before re-entry. The Apollo experience is especially significant because it is based on approximately 2,390 hours of manned flight and 44,000 IMU operating hours during lab laboratory and spacecraft checkout. Altogether, this is, is enormously more flight hours of experience than is available on any other INS system of comparable complexity used in ballistic missile and space flight. In the case of airline and military transport experience, there are carefully analyzed reliability records of on some 5 million INS aircraft system operating hours on commercial airlines. Inertial Navigation Systems, INS, is, that's what that is. Uh, in the commercial aircraft operating environment, the Carousel 4 has experienced a worldwide average MTBF of around 1,500 hours in the last six months. This same equipment in the somewhat more favorable environment of the United States Air Force command ship installation has demonstrated an MTBF in excess of 3,000 hours. In contrast with this, the com competitive equipment is demonstrating about one half this MTBF based on scheduled 747 airline aircraft operating hours, hours experience. Uh, so this is clearly, um, it, he was an engineer for General Motors uh, and was a contractor on NASA projects. And, and this speech um, is clearly designed to address the benefits of continuing to use them as a contractor and uh, how their products are superior. So it, it's sort of like serving the purpose of a sales pitch, but for people who are technically inclined and more interested in the equipment than in being sold to. At least that is my interpretation of this from what we have read so far. Specifically talking about how reliable their systems are and what applications they've been used for, um, how uh, their experience with launching these systems over and over and over again gives them a significantly more test time in real use cases than um, uh, basically anything else has <laughs> uh, because from testing and then actual in, uh, actual use in real world situations um, they've logged more hours of experience with these machines than even commercial aircraft according to this what he has said in here uh, it's interesting I I'm curious this is 1973 um, I'm curious as to how this narrative changes after 1986. Um, it's been a few years since I specifically went and watched uh, some of the available information regarding uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger. Uh, 1986 is when the uh, Space Shuttle Challenger blew up on launch, and um, I, navigation and guidance systems, which is what this is primarily concerned with, um, <clears throat> were not primarily responsible for that. Uh, but it'd be it'd be interesting to me to see uh, sort of. how the contractors approached topics after that, because that was kind of the, the first major incident with the, the space program. There had been um, issues like Apollo 13 and, and stuff like that, but there had not been significant loss of life prior to the Challenger in, in, in sort of the same way. So anyway, uh, 
I found it fascinating. I hope that you found this at, at least interesting. Um, I did not know that we were going to be looking at actual rocket science today. Um, talking about orbital mechanics and digging into some technical reports about rocketry and, and rocket science and, and stuff like that. There's always that potential whenever we look at anything NASA related, which uh, we have a number of collections and they're all kind of interesting. So um, I, I, I pick them every once in a while. Um, but so hopefully, hopefully you all found it interesting. Uh, just as a teaser, again, I'm just going to uh, tell you about what is planned for next week. Give me one second while I pull up this finding aid um, because it was interesting to me uh, and caught my eye. I was literally just, show me everything, and then went and looked to see... Uh, what like subject terms had been used to describe our materials and there was one like a subject term wineries or something like that and I was like okay let's click on that and see what's there um, hang on the internet is being slow while I'm, I'm trying to look up specifically which collection it is uh, but when I clicked into it, I was like, well, that doesn't sound too terribly interesting. Oh, there we go. Hello, system, catching up. Um, but then I started reading the description, and, and so, uh, oh, come on. All right, let me find this finding aid real quick, and we will, I, I will tell you what we are looking at next week. Um, it is the Frank Leslie Campbell Papers. And so just to let you know uh, what's coming up next week, in case you're interested in stopping by, um, this collection consists of more than 5,500 wine bottle labels gathered by Frank Campbell, an entomologist with the National Academy of Science, National Research Council, and his wife, Ina. The labels have been affixed to index cards with each card bearing Campbell's commentary on data, or commentary on date, place, and method of acquisition, as well as the quality of the wine. The collection also includes a typescript draft of the Campbell's 1964 to 1966 European travel memoir, Better Late, an entomologist's post-retirement renovation. Uh, so, initially, when I pulled up the collection, I was like, this seems like a strange collection. Why would I want to look at this? Uh, because that was before I got to the scope and content note, which I just read you, which sounds amazing. And so next week, we are going to look at the Campbell Collection of 5,500 wine labels. We will definitely not look at every wine label, but it sounds fascinating to me. And hopefully I will see some of you then. Um, let me go ahead and set up raids so that we can end this stream uh, by heading off to somewhere chill. Um, we are gonna pop over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium as we typically do. I do um, want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting. Um, oh jeez, what is my computer doing? Woo, there we go. Uh, let's set up the raid to the aquarium. Um, and uh, thank you once again, 16-Bit uh, Eric and Mix Harry Ann for uh, bringing your communities over to join me for the archives stream today. Um, it means a lot that you trust them with me. Um, 
and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Um, have a, a, a chill time with the Monterey Bay Aquarium this afternoon or, you know, evening or morning or whatever time it is for you. Um, and hopefully I see you again as we continue to explore what's in the archives. Um, I really enjoy it and hopefully, the, hopefully you do too. <laughs> Keep exploring everybody. Uh.